Dead America. Kansas, Part 3, by Derek Slayton. Chapter 1, Day 0 plus 48. Atticus leaned far back in his chair, looking straight up at the ceiling to give his eyes a rest. He'd been reading report after report after report, and he was starting to really feel it. I need five before I hit the next one, he thought to himself, and got up from his desk, walking out of the darkened room. He was momentarily blinded by the brightness coming from the main area of the high-rise apartment. It was early afternoon, and the amount of sunlight pouring into the living space made that point very clear. Atticus started to open his mouth, but Evelyn put her finger over her mouth, waving at him from the kitchen. He sealed his lips and leaned in as she pointed to the couch, where his young daughter Susie snored away as her cartoon played in the background. Evelyn held up a couple bottles of water, motioning for them to head towards the bedroom patio. He nodded, and the two of them walked quietly down the hallway to the master bedroom and onto the patio. Once out there, she handed over the water, and they took a few sips while admiring the view, his eyes finally adjusting to the brightness. There had been a light snowfall the night before, but it was beginning to melt off under the sun. There was more than enough to cast a bright light up to them, though making the daylight seem even brighter, despite his tired eyes, still felt good on his skin. Looks like they're making good progress on that greenhouse, Evelyn said pointing to a shorter building across the street where several people were putting the finishing touches on a greenhouse that took up the majority of the space on the roof. Several other people were bringing in potted plants and bags of dirt, filling them into the nearly complete structure. Never a big fan of fresh vegetables, Atticus admitted, but I would kill for a BLT right now. She smirked. Might have to settle for an LT for the time being, she said, shaking her head unless they come across some of that soy-based fake stuff. We've already lost so much in this fight, Atticus said with a dramatic sigh. The last thing I'm going to do is dishonor the memory of a fallen comrade. Evelyn stared at him for a moment in confusion. Are you... She slowed down as it slowly dawned on her. Are you talking about the bacon? He jokingly put a hand over his heart, giving her a lopsided smile. May it live on fondly in our memories, he said. They shared a laugh, her shaking her head, and once it calmed down, she leaned against the railing. So how are the Kansas Chronicles coming along, she asked. Just wrapped up day nine, Atticus said. She cocked a brow when he didn't elaborate. And, she asked. It's, he paused to sigh, it's starting to get pretty bad. This Bennett guy. Evelyn nodded slowly. The captain, she asked. Yeah, he's starting to lose it a bit, he confirmed. I mean, I can't say I blame him entirely, though. She pursed her lips. Don't go taking the side of psychopaths now, she warned. He chuckled, shaking his head. Oh, no, nothing like that, he said. But losing so many men due to people above him making the wrong decisions. I've been there, albeit to a lesser extent. She stared up at him, all seriousness now. How'd you react? she asked. Atticus held up his hand, pointing to a scar on one of his knuckles. Fractured this knuckle on the man's eye socket, he said. Then spent the next three months making friends with a bottle. I can't imagine, Evelyn murmured. And if you're lucky, you never will, he replied standing and staring out over the glowing skyline for another few moments, taking another sip of water before sealing the bottle up tight. What time are you wanting to do dinner tonight? Couple hours, she replied. Okay, I'm going to get back to it, he said with a nod. I think I can squeeze the next report in before that. She smiled. I'm making a casserole, so if it needs to sit for a bit, that'll be okay, she said gently. He offered her a smile. You're the best, he said in all sincerity. She smirked. Just remember that next time you're gallivanting around and see something sparkly, she said, pointing a finger at him. He grinned, giving her a little salute before heading back inside. He entered the dark room again, shutting the door and sitting down in front of his computer, 
the glow of the monitor like acid on his eyes once again. He sighed, double-clicking on the next file. Day 10, it read. The Spring Hill Incident. The following report comes mostly from first-hand accounts of the day from multiple participants. Atticus paused and clicked. Next page. Okay, let's get it going, he said. Chapter 2. Day 0, plus 10. Sergeant Cook and Private Morgan were less than a mile outside of the small town of Spring Hill, right on the highway, pushing cars from the side of the road into the middle to create a bit of a barricade. Cook stopped after they got the last one into the formation, which was only half a dozen vehicles or so. Should we pop the tires? Morgan asked. If you want to waste your ammo on that, you go right ahead, Cook replied, shaking his head. But since we're at least a couple days away from another resupply, I'm not using a single bullet on anything that isn't a zombie skull. I mean, I do have a knife, Morgan said dryly. Come here, the sergeant instructed, waving him over. Let me show you something. The private approached him, and Cook raised a pair of binoculars, looking down the highway. He handed them over, and Morgan took a look for himself. There were thousands of zombies on the road shambling in their direction, no more than a quarter mile from their current position. Morgan let out a long, horrified but impressed whistle. That does not look like a good time at all, he muttered. You have any idea how much pressure a mob that size can put on something that's in their way? Cook asked. No clue, Morgan admitted, shaking his head. How much? Fuck if I know, the sergeant huffed but I know it's more than enough to push these cars out of the way like they're toys. I don't think the wheels being inflated or not is going to change that. Morgan shrugged sheepishly. So why are we out here then, he asked. Captain needed some more time to evacuate the town, Cook explained. Been using it as an off-the-front-line medical site from whatever you want to call that Kansas City assault. The private sighed, shaking his head. How the hell are we this disorganized, man? He asked helplessly. Like we're supposed to be the best of the best, and we can't even get trucks here in time to evacuate the wounded before we're overrun by those things. This ain't the good old days, the sergeant said, shoulders slumping. Every wounded soldier is an out-and-out -out liability now. Morgan's brow furrowed, his gaze hardening. So we should leave them behind, he demanded. Cook shook his head. No, nothing like that, he said, waving a hand in front of his face. But man, we have no supply lines. No manufacturing base. If it doesn't currently exist, it's not going to exist for God only knows how long. Injured troops take up a lot of resources that we may not even have. And if the rumors are true that we're headed out for some big assault, expending resources on people who won't be able to fight, it's pretty easy to see why we're not exactly very high up on the food chain when it comes to evacuation. Morgan bristled. And that doesn't piss you off, he snapped. Cook sighed again, giving a half-joking smile. I knew I was expendable before I signed the recruitment papers, he said. Can't be pissed off about something I've already accepted. The private rubbed his forehead, staring out at the horde in the distance. So... You want to keep on going with this bullshit, he asked. Unless something better comes along, I guess I'm in it for the long haul, Cook replied, holding his hand out for the binoculars. Once they were back in his possession, he looked through them again, finding the mob a quarter mile away, some of them getting excited as a potential fresh meal came into view. Come on, let's get back to town, he said, and waved for Morgan to follow. They got back into the sedan they'd arrived in and hit the gas, leaving the zombies behind, though they wouldn't be long. Meanwhile, across town, Connie Deacon walked out of her house in what had once been a sweet tiny town of 8,000 people, looking around at the mess it had become. She ran a hand through her brown shoulder-length hair and crossed her strong arms. Most of the town's population had either died, fled, or been pushed out, by the military over the last week and a half. Connie and her sister Maya were among the relative few of less than a hundred that had been allowed to stay in town, mainly because Maya was a nursing student, 
and was deemed essential. The military had ordered Connie to leave, but she had refused. With their parents deceased, Connie and Maya were all each other had left, and she wasn't about to leave. Most days over the past week had been pretty similar, with throngs of soldiers coming and going, mostly from the center of town where a medical facility had been set up to help deal with the influx of patients. The Battle of Kansas City had sent a lot of people to them, but it had slowed down to virtually nothing over the past couple of days as the military pulled back. Connie walked a couple of blocks over to the center part of town, where a handful of soldiers were putting up a makeshift barricade on the highway to the north, which was a little comforting to her. She walked over to a couple of locals, who were looking on while sipping coffee. What's going on? she asked. No clue, one of the men admitted, shaking his head. A couple of trucks rolled in half an hour ago to the med tent by the courthouse, and those folks started blocking off the road. Have you seen Maya? she asked. He shook his head again. I haven't, sorry, he replied. Keep your eyes on them, she instructed firmly. I'm headed over to the med tent. If something starts going crazy, let me know. The man nodded. You got it, he agreed. Connie kept walking another few blocks to the medical tent. It was huge, taking up the entirety of the front lawn of the very ornate courthouse sitting in the middle of town. There were several trucks backed up to the tents, with soldiers helping wounded men up onto it. As Connie approached, two soldiers noticed and stepped into her path. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I can't let you in, one of them said. My sister is in there, Connie replied, head held high. I'm sorry, the soldier repeated. I have my orders. She cocked a brow. She spent the last week working 18-hour days to keep you guys alive, she said. She's not even out of nursing school yet and has already seen things that would haunt a seasoned nurse. I don't know what's going on here, but I'm going to go get her. She took a step forward, and one of the soldiers grabbed her shoulder. Connie didn't speak, instead immediately reacting by flinging her arm upwards and grabbing him very strongly by the balls. The soldier winced in pain, letting go of her as his knees buckled. Didn't your mother ever teach you about respecting a lady? Connie drawled. You don't touch them unless they invite you to. I don't recall saying it was okay for you to put your hands on me. She glanced at the other soldier. Do you remember me saying he could touch me? The other soldier shook his head silently. Eyes widened in horror but also dancing with amusement at his companion, getting put in his place. Well, if I don't remember, and your friend doesn't remember, I think it's safe to assume that I didn't, Connie purred, yanking down on the soldier's balls a little harder. I'm going to get my sister now. She glanced at the other soldier. That all right with you? The still-standing soldier raised his palms. Fine by me, ma'am, he said. Connie let go of her handful of bits, letting the soldier who touched her crumple to the ground in the fetal position. She didn't spare him another glance, walking past the tents and into the building where Maya usually worked. It was where they kept the most injured patients, and since her sister wasn't the most experienced nurse, she was used for basic things like changing bandages and whatnot. There were several empty tents that had been gutted of everyone and everything other than bloody wrappings and a handful of cots. As Connie got to the doors of the courthouse, she went inside and saw more chaos. General Rothman walked around with a few soldiers, looking at some of the most wounded, shaking his head at most of them while giving a select few a thumbs up. Connie didn't listen to it for too long before she heard Maya screaming from upstairs. It wasn't a panicked scream, Rather, it was a you-need-to-do-what-I-say kind of scream. Having been on the receiving end of that many a time, Connie took off to find her before she could get herself into too much trouble. When she entered the room just off of the stairwell, her younger sister stood there in all her fiery glory, yelling at a couple of soldiers and a doctor. I'm telling you that she's going to be fine, Maya snarled motioning to a blonde woman in the bed with her leg propped up. The doctor sighed. 
Your objections have been noted, he said, rubbing his wrinkled forehead with exhaustion. Now, we need to move on. No, we're not leaving until you listen to me. Maya all but stomped her foot in anger. Her leg is healing fine. Few more days and she'll be up and moving. And I disagree, the doctor replied, shaking his head. The damage to the leg from the explosion severed numerous tendons, and it'll be a miracle if she ever walks again. You're wrong, Maya shot back. So agitated her hands were shaking. The shrapnel missed them by millimeters, but it did miss them. He rolled his eyes with all the condescension a 60-year-old white man could muster. Oh, so you came to that conclusion with all of your many months of medical training, did you? He drawled. I've been a doctor for twice as long as you've been alive. You were a pediatrician, she cried. Be that as it may, I'm the expert and my decision is final, the doctor snapped, and turned to the soldiers. Come, we have more patients. He waved a hand at Maya. Give this patient the shot, then you can consider yourself relieved. Your services are no longer required. I suggest you run on home and start packing. One soldier grabbed the doctor by the arm as he said the words, his eyes wide as if the doctor had said something he wasn't supposed to. Start packing, Connie finally spoke up. What for? Pardon us, ma'am, the soldier said, and they pushed past Connie with the doctor in tow. Maya's eyes swelled with tears, and she brought her hands to her face. Connie rushed over to her, wrapping her in a hug. What's going on, she asked. They're leaving, Maya cried. Connie shook her head, holding her sister tighter. Okay, calm down and tell me why that's upsetting you, she said gently. Might be nice to get our town back. You don't understand, her sister sniffled. They're leaving because something's wrong. Connie's brow furrowed. What's wrong, she asked stepping back a bit to look down at her. I don't know, Maya admitted, wiping furiously at her eyes. But they're taking the dock around to say who is safe to move and who isn't. That's pretty common, isn't it? Connie asked, keeping her voice level and diplomatic. Move the healthiest ones first. Maya gritted her teeth. That's the thing. They're not prepping them to move later, she said. Jutting out her chin, the shot the doc ordered me to give is a lethal dose of painkiller. Tani's blood ran cold. They're killing their own troops, she asked, shaking her head and stepping back. That can't be right. You must have misheard. You... They've already done it for five people, Maya said, voice pleading, pressing her hands together. I... I couldn't stop it. All I could do was argue that they'd be okay. Connie blinked rapidly, trying not to panic as she registered the information. Okay, but what about this woman? She asked, motioning to the patient lying on the bed. Were you lying about those things because you wanted to save her, or will she really be okay? Her name is Piper, Maya explained, looking at the patient with sad eyes. And I was telling the truth. She's going to be okay. Connie looked around, trying to figure out what to do next. The room they were in was a converted office, and Piper was the only patient left in it. Do you have a key to this room? She asked. Maya's brow furrowed. Yeah, I do. Why? She asked. Connie leaned over Piper, noticing she was barely conscious. Did you give her painkillers recently? She asked. Maya nodded. About an hour ago before the military showed up, she explained. Makes her kind of loopy for a couple of hours. Connie knelt down right beside the bed, getting close to Piper's face. Hey, look at me, she barked. Look at me, after a few failed attempts, she smacked the woman on the face. Connie, Maya gasped. Piper blinked slowly, finally focusing on Connie's face. Do you want to live? Connie demanded. The woman swallowed slowly and gave a very sluggish nod. Okay, then I need you to do exactly what I say, Connie instructed. 
Can you do that? Piper nodded again, a little quicker this time. I'm putting the sheet over your head, and I need you to stay here until we come and get you, Connie explained. Do you understand? Piper nodded a third time. Okay, good, Connie said, standing up and laying the sheet over the woman's face. We'll be back soon. Maya stood in the center of the room, shaking like a leaf. We'll come back for her, I promise, her sister said, holding out her hand. But right now, we need to get back to the house and get things packed. And go where? Maya asked as she took her hand. Connie shook her head and replied, from the sounds of it, anywhere but here. Chapter 3 Cook and Morgan pulled up to the edge of town where they had created a mini blockade with cars. They had blocked off the highway leading through the heart of town and used cars and cheap barbed wire to stretch the barricade out from it. It was flimsy, but it was there. As the duo pulled up, they spotted the captain with two corporals in tow and got out of the car. Cook. Morgan, what's the situation? Captain Bennett asked in his gruff way. Thousands of those things headed for our position, Cook replied, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Maybe 15, 20 minutes out. How's your barricade looking? Corporal Rice asked. About as good as this one, Morgan replied, kicking the tire on one of the cars. Going to hold them up for a couple of minutes at best. Corporal Huff sighed. Not even sure why we bothered, he muttered. Five minutes is better than no minutes, Cook suggested. The group shared a chuckle at the absurdity of that statement. As they laughed, General Rothman approached, cocking a brow. Good to see that you men are in good spirits, he declared. We try to keep things light, Bennett explained. Helps us handle the dark better. The general nodded slowly. Oh, I like that one, he said, wagging a finger at him. Going to have to remember it. You got everybody packed up from the medical facility? The captain asked. Rothman nodded again. Everyone we're taking, he said. Bennett did a double take, brow furrowing. Everybody you're taking? He asked slowly. You're not taking everyone? The general shook his head. Limited space in the trucks, he explained with a noncommittal shrug. And as much as I hate to say it, some of those boys are just too far gone. We don't have the capacity to take care of them. So you're leaving them behind? Bennett demanded, hackles rising. No, I'm not that cruel, the general said with a wave of his hand. I had the doctor give them an appropriate level of painkillers. The captain stared at him in shock. You put them down like dogs, he breathed. It's the burden of being in command, Rothman said, raising his chin. He barely finished his sentence before Bennett lunged at him, growling. The corporals caught his arms before he could make contact. You, motherfucker, the captain snarled, thrashing in their grip. Rothman stared down his nose at him. Is that any way to talk to your commanding officer? He asked. Bennett growled in response, and the general simply smirked back at him, the smug rolling off of him in waves. A few soldiers approached, coming up behind Rothman. One of them leaned over hand on his rifle. Is everything okay, General? He asked. Rothman nodded. It's just fine, he said, clasping his hands behind his back. The captain here was just letting out some aggression, which, you know, is going to come in handy because you're going to cover our retreat. Bennett's eyes widened. What are you talking about? He demanded, finally shaking off the corporals and standing still. That mob that's coming our way, it's big, the general explained. I need you to slow them down however you can. Give us time to get away and situated. The captain seethed, clenching and unclenching his fists. Rothman cocked a brow. Is that a problem, captain? He asked, voice full of warning. No, sir, Bennett snapped. But just know that this issue isn't over. You're free to cry to whoever you think will listen the general declared, waving a hand. In the meantime, do your job and slow that mob down. He cocked his head. And I have to say, Captain, I expected better from you. 
you of all people should know about sacrifice. Now get this done and regroup in Ottawa. I'll have your next assignment there. With that, he turned and walked away with the soldiers, leaving Bennett standing there, shaking and stewing. When the general was out of earshot, he whipped away from his men, punching the air. Fucking hell, he bellowed. I swear, that's the last order I take from that man. Before he could continue, the moans grew substantially louder, and he turned towards the highway, seeing the front edge of the massive, thousand-strong horde within his line of sight. Shit, he muttered. How long we got? Reese asked. Cook did some mental calculations. Based on their speed, and how quickly they dismantled the barricade we set up. He said slowly, maybe ten minutes. Bennett calmed himself, trying to focus on the task at hand. He knew that if he abandoned his post and Rothman caught him, it could mean a court-martial, which in this crisis would most likely result in death. Finally, he got into it, barking out orders to get the men moving on a defense. Rice. Huff. Get into those houses and get anything that can be used as a Molotov, he instructed. The fire won't stop them, but it'll hopefully slow them down. Morgan, you're with me. We're going to hit the houses on the other side here. And me? Cook asked. I need you to get back to the med tent. Start telling anybody who will listen that they need to get out of town, Bennett said. Cook nodded and turned around to dart off but gunfire erupted in the distance, putting them all on edge. What the hell is going on? Huff asked. More gunshots went off, followed by the screeching of tires and engines roaring. Courthouse now! Bennett bellowed, and the group readied their rifles, running towards the source of the gunfire, unsure of what to expect. They made it a block over, pressing up against a building, not wanting to run directly into bullets. The captain was on point, looking out towards the courthouse. There were a couple of civilians laying on the ground with others around them, and a soldier laying face down a few yards away from them, not moving. Further away, the transport trucks vanished on the horizon. Looks like someone didn't like the military abandoning town, Bennett mused. Are they clear? Cook asked. The captain nodded. Yeah, looks like one of ours is down for the count, though, he said. Eyes narrowed. Captain, we don't know what happened, Cook murmured, hoping to defuse Bennett. For all we know, Rothman fired first. Bennett took a deep breath, knowing that Cook was right. The sergeant stepped from the line, slinging his rifle over his shoulder and raising his hands. What the hell are you doing? Rice hissed. We got eight minutes before this town is overrun, Cook said. These people need to know. Captain, Huff pleaded. Bennett shrugged. It's Cook's choice, he said. The sergeant stepped out from behind cover, walking slowly. He paused before he got fully out. Just watch my back, he said, and Bennett nodded. Cook stepped out taking several steps away from the building and into plain view of the civilians. It didn't take long for them to notice the soldier in their midst. Stop right there! One of the civilians screamed, gripping his gun. Cook complied, stopping short with his hands high as several more people turned towards him. They stopped about ten yards away, at least holding their guns at their sides. Oh, so you boys want to surrender now, huh? The other man demanded. Gun us down, then beg for mercy. He raised his shotgun, but Bennett stepped out from behind cover, aiming his rifle directly at the man's head. Don't you raise that gun another inch, he warned loudly. The escalation continued, prompting half a dozen civilians to come towards them, raising guns and causing the rest of the troops to back up their captain in a standoff. Before long, a dozen people stood there, making a sandwich of cook who still stood with his hands up. Everybody calm down, he barked, cutting into the bickering and yelling and threats. You need to listen to me, everybody. My brother is dead because you opened fire on us. Somebody yelled from the civilian side. We didn't open fire on anybody, the sergeant said firmly. 
We were trying to figure out how to protect this town. Bullshit, another man yelled. Same uniform, same team. Look, man, you can shoot me if you want, but it won't change what's about to happen to this town, Cook finally said. The civilians looked at each other nervously, unsure of what to make of that statement. What are you talking about? The man with the shotgun finally asked. Cook motioned behind him without totally lowering his hands. Thousands of those things are headed this way, he said. In five, maybe ten minutes, this town is going to be wiped off the map, overrun by those things. The civilians glanced back and forth at each other, not sure if they should believe him or not. You're lying, one of them accused. You just want us to lower our guard. Cook poked the top of his ear. Listen, he instructed. Everybody fell silent, and there was no mistaking the sound of moans filling the void. The civilians murmured in shock, and the guy with the shotgun aimed at Cook even more forcefully. Then you better start protecting us, he snarled. They wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. The sergeant shook his head. We've done all we can. We've bought you minutes to get your things and flee, he said. Flee and what? Another man cried. You assholes took all of our gas. Are we supposed to hike out of here? Better than facing that, Cook said. We don't have time for this, Cap, Rice warned. Nobody do a damn thing. Cook barked, then turned back to the man wielding the shotgun. We are out of time. Those things are nearly here, and my friends are on edge. Now you need to put down your weapons before something. A shot rang out in the distance, cutting him off, and grazed his upper arm, dropping him to the ground more out of shock than pain. This was all it took to set off his men, who immediately opened fire. The training allowed for them to get the jump on the civilians, who hesitated following the gunshot. It only took a split second for the soldiers to put down the civilians who'd been aiming their guns, and there was a brief moment of quiet after the slaughter. Bennett slid down next to Cook, grabbing his arm. Cook, are you good buddy? he demanded. The sergeant sat up, a little rattled and inspected his wound. It was minor, but stung a little. Yeah, I'm okay, he said, nodding jerkily. But damn it. He stared at the bodies bleeding out on the ground, frustration and anger rolling over him in waves. He didn't lash out because he knew his comrades didn't do anything wrong. It was just what they were trained to do. But it didn't feel good. It didn't feel right. Another shot went off in the distance the bullet narrowly missing the two soldiers. They both looked up, finding a glint in the window of the second floor of the courthouse. Sniper, Bennett barked. Second floor. Rice and Huff turned their attention towards the second floor of the building, scanning the windows for any movement. They spotted it after a moment, popping off a few shots to force them back behind cover. Just give the word cap, and we'll hunt that prick down, Huff said. Morgan looked behind them. Contact rear, he cried, turning and firing at a couple of civilians trying to flank them. He missed, but forced them behind cover. Forget it. We gotta get out of here, Bennett grunted and reached down, grabbing Cook and hoisting him up off of the ground. Several more shots went off as some of the civilians that had been in the courthouse emerged and opened fire towards the soldiers. It was a running firefight as the soldiers tore off of the road and towards a small restaurant. Bennett fired towards the window as he ran, blowing out the glass and giving them a pathway in. He ran straight to the back while the rest of the men laid down covering fire out the front door. The captain kicked open the back door, coming face to face with a couple of civilians rushing towards him with weapons. He didn't hesitate, opening fire and putting a bullet in each of them center mass. As the gunfire at the front of the building intensified, he looked around for an escape. We're clear, he yelled back into the store. The gunfire at the front of the restaurant slowed down as the men rushed through to the back and stood there for a moment, fortifying their position. Where are we going, Captain? Morgan asked. We gotta get back to the car that you and Cook drove in, Bennett said. Cap? 
Cook asked, eyes widening. I know it's crazy, Bennett huffed, but that's the only working vehicle I'm aware of in this town. So if you got a better idea, the men all shared glances, but nobody did. So eventually, they all nodded. Let's do it, Rice said, and they readied their weapons. Bennett turned and led the men towards the car at the barricade, where the zombies were dangerously close. The men moved quickly as bullets continued to fly in their direction from the angry residents. The group returned fire, not very accurately, as they were more concerned with getting to the car than getting into a fight. As they came around the corner of the last building, they could see the zombie horde about 30 yards away from the car and closing. Move! 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 Bennett yelled, running hard. He put some space between himself and the other men, opening fire towards the zombies, concentrating his fire on the ones closest to the car, which was parked horizontally across the road. Rice and Huff continued to fire back towards the civilians, keeping them at bay. However, once they got a glimpse of the zombie mob headed towards their town, they turned and ran, quickly losing interest in the soldiers. Bennett made it to the barricade, leaping up on top of it and running over the cars to the ground. The escape vehicle was about 10 yards up, only 15 yards from the closest zombie. The rest of the troops followed suit, running and making it to the car along with Bennett, who came around the front as a few zombies shambled to within five yards or so. The captain fired wildly with one hand as he used the other to grab the door handle and pull it hard. The bullets missed their mark with the headshots, but the impact in the chest is enough to slow them down, even if just for a second or two. Bennett got in and started the car up as the others quickly piled in from the passenger side. Cook rode shotgun, and Morgan was the last one in the back. Doe, go, go, he screamed, and Bennett threw it into drive and slammed the gas, quickly gaining traction on the road and going off the pavement. Hang on, the captain warned and sped off, narrowly missing the outstretched rotting hands of the zombies. The vehicle bumped violently on the rough terrain of the field. They sped around for a few moments, Bennett struggling to maintain control of the car. Finally, he got it to a side street, pulling it on and pausing for a moment. What are you waiting on? Let's go, Cook urged. Bennett drew his sidearm and rested it in his lap. We're on the outskirts, but keep your eyes peeled, he instructed. These people aren't happy with us. There was a chorus of yes, sir, before Bennett hit the gas. The car accelerated quickly, screaming down a residential street. As they approached the end of the road, a shot rang out from just up ahead and to the side of the car, shattering the driver's side window. Bennett and Rice opened fire from the driver's side, the captain not letting off the gas as they got to the other side of town, cutting back across to the main portion of the road. Did you hit anything? Cook asked, looking behind them. No clue, Rice admitted. Doesn't matter, Bennett quipped. We're out of that town. He glanced at his arm, wincing at the feel of blood running down his face. It was clear there was glass embedded in it from the window explosion. Bennett couldn't stop the warring emotions running through him. There was anger at the civilians for opening fire on him and his men. Sadness for the comrades they had left behind. But mostly, just an outright hatred for General Rothman. Where are we going, Cap? Cook asked, cutting into his morose thoughts. If you say the rendezvous point, you can just let me out here, Huff declared. Rice raised a hand. Same here, he said. I didn't come back for this bullshit. Bennett slammed on the brakes now that they were solidly outside of the town. And nobody, alive or dead, was following them. He took a moment to steady himself before speaking, turning to face his men. I'm only speaking for myself, but I'm done with this, he declared. I'm done following orders of someone so incompetent, so indifferent to the lives of my brothers and sisters in arms. He gritted his teeth, swallowing back the anger in his voice so he could continue more calmly. I'm also done playing nice with the civilians. He pointed to his bloody, glass-filled face. It's pretty clear that they have no interest in working with us. 
so I'm doing things my own way from here on out. Cook blinked at him in shock. You want to go AWOL, he asked. You can call it whatever you want, but the main force is pulling out, Bennett said. A week or two from now, the only soldiers left in the state are going to be the ones who want to be here. We can't be the only ones who are fed up with things, Rice pointed out. No, we cannot, the captain agreed. I know people who were ready to walk when we cut and ran from the base on day one of this shit. Wouldn't take much convincing for them to join us. Huff cocked a brow. You got a plan, Cap, he asked. Enough of a plan to get us started on our own, Bennett said. We hit a transport depot. Get us a truck or two of goods, then find a spot to lie low while they leave the state to us. What about building our numbers? Rice asked. That's where you and Huff come in, the captain continued, motioning to them. Cook, Morgan, and myself will have a target on us once they realize we're not where we're supposed to be. But you two. You're volunteers who can walk away at any time you want. You can also move freely. I'll get you the names of people to track down. You drop my name and what we're doing, and they'll join up. There was a moment of silence as the men looked around at each other, trying to figure out if this was the path they wanted to take. Moment of truth, Bennett finally said, turning towards the steering wheel. If you're with me, then you're throwing in right now. If you're out, no hard feelings. I'll drop you off at the next town and wish you luck. Yeah, we're in, Rice said, speaking for him and Huff. You've kept me alive this long. I'm in, Morgan added. Cook hesitated, unsure of what to say. Bennett eyed him. What's your concern, he asked. I'm from this area, the sergeant said slowly. These are my people. All the more reason to stay with us, the captain said. Do some actual good instead of leaving them on their own to clean up our messes. Cook took a deep breath. I'm in if you give me your word on something, he said. Bennett cocked his head curiously. If I can give you my word, I will, he replied with a nod. You've done really good the last week. You've earned the right to ask. Like I said, these are my people, Cook reiterated. If we're doing this on our own, I want your word that we'll try and get civilians on our side rather than just eliminating them. I know we had to do what we had to do back there. And if they're shooting at us, I'll be the first one to throw down. I just want your word that diplomacy is the preferred path. Bennett stayed quiet for a moment before slowly nodding his head and extending his hand for a shake. You have my word, Cook, he said firmly. The sergeant shook with him. Then I'm in, he said. Oh, and I do have one more request. And that is, Bennett asked, brow rising. If we have a chance to take out Rothman, Cook said, raising a finger. We take it. That's something I can fully get behind, Bennett agreed. The men nodded and murmured amongst themselves. They had taken a step that they couldn't untake, but a nervous excitement filled the air. Bennett finally put the car back in drive. Okay, let's get going, he said. Lots of work to be done. Chapter 4 Earlier Connie and Maya walked down the stairs of the courthouse as the military ramped up the evacuations. The couple of soldiers that General Rothman had personally approved to move were heading out, leaving others behind. Are you taking everybody now? Maya asked one of the soldiers, but he ignored her, walking by with the wounded and out the door. Connie tugged on her sister's arm to get her moving. Come on, let's get back to the house, she said. As they walked towards the door, Shouting erupted from outside, some stern military voices and others belonging to scared civilians. Connie stopped, moving over to a window and pressing her sister against one of the concrete walls. Let me see, Maya hissed. Just stay there, Connie snapped, and looked out the window, but it was difficult to see the full picture. There were soldiers by their trucks, getting the last of the wounded loaded on, while a trio of them stood on the ground, hands on their rifles in defensive stances, but not aiming. She couldn't make out what was being said 
because of the distance and the thick courthouse walls. But it was clear from the body language and facial expressions that nobody was particularly happy. All of a sudden, a gunshot went off, and one of the soldiers went down in a heap. Connie jumped, and Maya clutched her arm, and gunfire filled the air shortly thereafter as the military returned fire. Connie peeked out the window as two soldiers were yanked into the truck, and the wheels spun out. What's going on? Maya asked shrilly. It's all over, Connie said, shaking her head slowly. The fighting is over. Maya knelt down, hands over her head, breathing speeding up. Her sister bent down, grabbing her arms, pulling her up and forcing her to look into her eyes. We gotta go, she said firmly. Maya nodded jerkily, taking deep breaths to try to compose herself. They shot him, somebody screamed from the front door. They shot him, please, we need help. Maya stiffened, immediately shifting into nurse mode stepping into the doorway. Where are they? she asked. In the front yard, the man cried, hands flailing. Connie didn't fight her sister, seeing how focused she was. She followed her outside and found the closest downed person, a writhing body with a gut shot, moaning in pain. She watched as her sister ran over and knelt, evaluating them. Connie looked around, taking stock of the situation as her sister worked on the wounded. It didn't take long for her to notice Sergeant Cook coming out from behind cover with his hands in the air. Several civilians started yelling and running over towards him, which was when the other soldiers emerged from their cover in a pretty big standoff. Connie backed up, keeping her eyes firmly on soldiers. Maya, we have to go, she hissed. I can't, her sister argued, not looking up. Maya? Connie said, more forcefully this time. I can't, her sister yelled. I gotta stop this bleeding or he'll be dead in minutes. Before Connie could say anything, a gunshot rang out from above them, and the soldiers immediately opened fire. She grabbed her sister by the arm, yanking her to the ground and throwing her body over top. There were several moments of intense gunfire, and Connie looked around frantically trying to plot their escape as people panicked around them. Maya tried to get back to the patient, but Connie kept a firm grip on her arm. We have to go, now! She barked as she dragged her sister along. But, they're killing everybody, Connie shrieked. He's dead no matter what you do, now come on! Maya realized that Connie was right and gave in, so they both took off running as the gunfire raged just up the road. They didn't look towards the battle, just pumped their legs hard to get to cover. As soon as they got to the side of one of the businesses, they took a brief moment to gather themselves. Couple more blocks. Come on, Connie huffed. We have to get home. Okay, Maya gasped, eyes wide with shock. Connie continued to pull her along, and they ran hard a few more blocks to their house, which was on the last street on the edge of town. They ran inside the small one-story brick house, and Connie finally let her sister go. Get your backpack. Put as much food and bottled water in there as you can, she instructed. Maya followed the instructions, pulling food from cupboards. Where are we going, she asked. Anywhere other than here, Connie replied, and headed to the master bedroom, which she had taken over once their parents passed on. All along, one wall were awards, photos, and trophies from various skeet shooting competitions from around the state, including one state title for her age group. She opened the closet, clicking on the light and pulling down a large wooden box from the top shelf, slamming it onto the bed and opening it up. Inside lay her well-loved competition skeet shooting shotgun. Hello, old friend, she murmured, running a hand over it afraid we're going to have to shoot at something other than clay this time. She went back into the closet, pulling out an ammunition bag and tossing it on the bed. She opened it up, and there were several boxes inside, all with different labels. She picked up one that read Competition Shells, and she immediately tossed that one back. The next one read Hunting. There we go, she said, and loaded up eight shells into the shotgun, the max her model could hold. 
she slung the ammo bag over her shoulder and headed back to the living room. There were a couple of backpacks on the ground, but she couldn't see her sister. Maya! she yelled, blood pressure rising. Maya! I'll be right out, her sister called, voice muffled by whatever room she was in. We have to go, Connie warned. Maya emerged from her bedroom, wearing clean jeans and a t-shirt. Sorry, she said breathlessly, just had to get out of those bloody clothes. Connie nodded, but before she could say anything, an engine roared in the distance. Maya's brow furrowed. Soldiers took all the gas in town, she said. Who is that? You stay down and away from the windows, Connie urged. You understand me? Her sister wrung her hands. Connie, she asked. Just do it, her sister snapped, and went outside just as the car screamed towards them up the road. She got a good look at them, realizing it was the soldiers who had started the shootout by the courthouse. She raised her shotgun and fired, blowing out the driver's side window. Almost immediately, return fire came from the car, and Connie hit the deck as bullets flew over her head and into the house. As soon as it stopped, she leapt up and aimed her shotgun, but the car was out of range. Yeah, you better run, she snarled and headed back into the house. Maya, we gotta go. There was no answer, and her panic rose once again. Maya. Connie's heart stopped, and she dropped her gun at the sight of her sister laying on the ground. Despite her instructions, Maya had approached the window. One of the retaliation bullets was square in the middle of her chest. No, 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 no. Connie choked out, tears spilling down her cheeks. You're okay. Maya shook her head, strangely looking calm as blood pooled on her chest. You. She gasped, struggling for breath. You have to go. No. No, Connie sobbed. I'm not going anywhere without you. Connie. Maya gasped, reaching up and touching her sister's face, wiping away a tear and leaving a smear of blood. Get Piper and go. Connie wailed, sobbing so hard she could barely get the words out. No, I'm not going without you. Yes, you are, Maya rasped. Just promise me you'll get Piper. Connie nodded, trying so hard to swallow her tears and be strong for her sister's last seconds alive. You have my word, she said, trying to sound firm. Maya smiled, but it quickly faded as she continued to bleed out, and a few moments later, she went limp. Connie held her and rocked back and forth before throwing her head back and screaming at the top of her lungs. She didn't know how long she sat there, but eventually fell back on her ass and breathed heavily, trying to compose herself even as tears still streamed down her face. Anger and grief coursed through her veins and then a gunshot echoed in the distance. She sobered, snapping back into the moment, and then more gunshots, then panic fire. Connie jumped up, grabbing her ammo bag and shotgun before rushing out of the house. When she made it out, chaos was coming from the direction of the courthouse, so she started running. She reached into her bag as she ran, refilling the shotgun. As she got closer to the courthouse, she realized that the gunshots were coming from one direction, which wasn't a sign of a firefight. That could only mean one thing. As she got closer, screams filled the air, putting her more and more on edge. She continued to run along the side street, looking forward in the direction of the courthouse. A couple of civilians screamed and ran away from the north end of town, where the barricade was. A few seconds later, a runner sprinted past the street. Oh, my God. God, she breathed to herself and picked up the pace, keeping her shotgun at the ready. As she approached the clearing into the center of town, a runner came across the side street, spotting her. It turned and let out a growl before sprinting towards her. Connie didn't hesitate, raising the shotgun and squeezing the trigger. She was a little rusty, but her aim was true, sending a shotgun round through the creature's head. 
She continued moving forward, looking to her left towards the direction the first runner had come through. She spotted it about 20 yards away, banging on the door of a business, no doubt trying to get into the people he was chasing. Connie fired a single round, hitting the creature in the side of the head. Before she could move in that direction to check on the people, a chorus of moans erupted from behind her. She turned towards about 50 zombies at the far end of the town square. Past them were thousands more, pushing their way through a small breach in the barricade. She knew time wasn't on her side, so she ran to the store the survivors were in, banging on the door to let them know she was safe. If you're alive in there, come on out, she barked. Two men she recognized appeared at the door, wide-eyed and rattled. Max, Zayden, she greeted. Are you two okay? Max nodded jerkily, though his tall and lanky frame quivered a little. Yeah, we're good, he replied. But damn, that thing nearly got us. It did get old Frank here, Zayden added, lightly kicking the zombie she'd cut down. We gotta get out of here, Max said. I gotta get a patient out of the courthouse first, Connie said. Zayden gaped at her, throwing up his broad football player arms. Are you kidding me? He blurted. They're the reason we're in this mess, and you want to help them. Made a promise to Maya, she said, clenching her jaw. Where is she? Max asked, looking around. She back at the house. Connie swallowed hard, unable to actually form the words, instead shaking her head the tiniest bit, making his face go pale. Fuck, he muttered. She took a deep breath. We can mourn later. Right now, we gotta get out of here. She stared firmly at Zayden, with the patient. He took a deep breath. Hope they're light, because we're going to have to walk out of here, he said. No, we're not, Max said. Dude, they took all the gas, the shorter man argued. Not all of it, Max said, shaking his head. Have a five-gallon canister underneath the shed. Connie nodded. Get over there and get your car running, she instructed and glanced at the coming mob. You're going to have to come get us. Meet at the opposite side of the courthouse in five. Move. Max took off running, and Connie turned towards several creatures that were nearby. She fell back into skeet shooting mode, picking her targets easily and rattling off shots one after another, dropping them quickly. Where the hell did you learn how to do that? Zayden blurted, gasping at her. Max and I grew up on the skeet shooting circuit, she explained as she led him across the street. You must have stayed with it a lot longer, he argued, because I know Max can't do that. Come on, she urged, and took off at a run, leading him towards the courthouse as people fled the area in every direction. This left only them and the horde of zombies, which were about 40 yards away from the entrance. When they got inside, Zayden turned around to shut the doors, but Connie grabbed his arm. What are you doing? he hissed. You're not going to like this, but I need you to stay here and lure them this way, she said. Face pinched. His jaw dropped. What? he demanded. Look, we need to keep them in front so we can get out the back, she explained quickly. Just stand here and make as much noise as you can. I won't be long. He jutted out his chin. They get too close and I'm shutting these things, he declared. Do it, she agreed and took off towards the stairs to the second floor, loading a few more shells into her shotgun. She quickly made her way to the door where Piper was, trying the knob but finding the door locked. She patted herself down, stomach sinking when she realized she'd left the keys with Maya. Damn it, she thought bitterly, and aimed the shotgun at the door latch, firing a single slug through it. The door flew open violently, and she dashed inside, but Piper wasn't in the bed. Piper, she called. A second later, the woman flew around the door with a bedpan, swinging it towards Connie, who managed to dodge it at the last second. Between the momentum and Piper being severely injured on the foot, she fell flat on her face. Connie reached down and grabbed her arm as she fell, 
making the landing a little easier. Piper thrashed, forcing the other woman to let go and grunted as she hit the floor. It's okay. I'm here to help, Connie assured her. Piper seethed. Then what's with the shotgun blast, huh? She hissed through her teeth. Door was locked, and I didn't have the key, Connie explained. You could have knocked, Piper huffed. Connie sighed. No offense, but last time I saw you, you didn't know what universe you were in, let alone have the capability to unlock a door, she said. And frankly, I'm in a hurry. Yeah, fair enough, Piper groaned. Can you help me up? Connie gave her a hand, and the soldier got up, shakily standing on her good foot. I've seen you before, she said. Connie nodded. About a half an hour ago, she explained. Piper's eyes lit up. Oh, you're Maya's sister, she said. The fog is clearing. Where is she? Connie gritted her teeth, sick of people asking her that question. She, she stammered, shaking her head. She, sorry, Piper said, face falling. I appreciate you coming back for me, all things considered. Connie took a deep breath. She made me promise, she said. The soldier smiled wanly. Don't worry. She did that to me too, she said. That's why I'm actually on my feet. You good to move? Connie asked. Piper nodded. Yeah, just don't ask me any complicated questions for a few hours, she said. Connie looked over to the corner and spotted a crutch. She grabbed it and handed it to the soldier before slinging her other arm over her shoulder. The two of them started moving down the hallway at a brisk pace, and Zayden's voice echoed from the first floor. Connie, come on, he yelled. Max is at the back door and they're coming towards him. Need a hand up here, Connie called. Zayden came to the stairs, seeing them up at the top and the condition Piper was in. He rushed up and snatched the crutch tossing it aside and sweeping the soldier off of her feet in one fluid motion. Hey! She cried as he settled her into his arms. Apologies, but you'll be thanking me in just a minute, he said, and led the charge down the stairwell to the first floor, making a quick turn and running down the hallway towards the far exit of the building. As they crashed through the doors, they spotted Max's car idling just a few yards away with a pack of easily 50 zombies, another 10 yards past it. Yeah, thank you, Piper breathed. Get her in the car, Connie barked, and Zayden rushed to the back seat to get the soldier situated as the skeet shooter champion went into action. She grabbed a few more shells from her bag and slammed them into the shotgun before firing. She picked her targets quickly and squeezed the trigger rapidly. Shooting slow-moving and head-high targets was a lot easier than shooting skeet, and the heads exploded one after the other. She dropped four before turning back to the car and getting into the front seat. Go! 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 she yelled. Max floored it, driving down the sidewalk and back to the road before going back towards the highway. He had to maneuver around a few zombies before getting in the clear. Just outside of town, they stopped for a moment looking back at their small community that was now swallowed by zombies. The makeshift barricade had completely failed, and thousands of ghouls swarmed the town, marching forward down the highway. Don't know about y'all, but I've seen more than enough, Zayden muttered. Where are we going? Max asked. We gotta go to Pola, Connie said. Zayden shook his head. That's only like ten miles, he said. That's not nearly far enough away from these things. That's the point, she insisted. Few hours from now, what just overran us will be bearing down on them. At the very least, we need to warn them. Max nodded. Good enough for me, he said, and hit the gas. As the vehicle sped away from town, Connie looked back one last time, sadness gripping her heart. I'm sorry, sis, she thought tears swelling in her eyes. Rest easy. Chapter 5 The group drove down the road towards Paola, looking out on the horizon as the sun began to hang a little lower in the sky. Everybody was still in shock of what happened, along with Piper, 
who was also trying to fully shake off the effects of the drugs in her system. Connie continued staring forward, knowing that there would be plenty of time to grieve later. There was still a lot to be done before she would be safe today. We're almost there, Max said, and pointed to the horizon, where the tiny town of Paola sat on the highway. Pre-apocalypse, it had been a town of a few thousand people, but as was common now, it was down to maybe a few hundred. So many people had died. Others fled, and others moved by the military to help with their operations. It wasn't exactly a draft, more of an encouraged volunteering. As they got closer to town, they noticed that there were no defenses set up and no signs of the military. The only thing they could see were a couple of guys hanging out on the highway. The duo spotted the car and waved them over. Max pulled up and rolled down the window, and one of the guards walked over. Wasn't expecting visitors today, he drawled. Max shrugged. Well, seemed like a nice day for a drive, he quipped. The guard peered through the window, his entire demeanor shifting with unease at the sight of the bloody passengers. Everything okay here? he asked. We need to talk to who's in charge, Connie said, leaning across the car towards the window. The guard blinked at her. That's Mayor Williams, but I don't, he began. What's your name? Connie cut in. Bobby, he replied. Well, Bobby, I've had a bad day, she said firmly. We all have. And what caused our bad day is currently marching down the highway towards you. Now, if you want to live to see the sunrise, I suggest you get us to Mayor Williams. Bobby's face paled and he nodded, taking a step back. Town Hall's a block over on your right, he instructed. Motioning, just pull up there and tell them boys what you told me. I'll radio over to them so they'll be expecting you. In the meantime, I figure I should probably keep watch. You can do one better than that, Connie replied, waving her hand around the area. You can start figuring out how to block off this road. He nodded somberly. Okay, he said. Max rolled up the window and drove off towards town hall. As they rolled through the town, Connie took in the sparse collection of people, ranging wildly in ages, from kids through to retirees. There seemed to be very few people of fighting age. Hopefully... Some of them have some gas buried beneath their sheds, Zayden murmured. We're not fighting a whole lot with this crew. They pulled up to the town hall, where a man in a suit that looked to be in his mid-fifties stood next to a shorter woman in a business casual outfit, holding a clipboard. They stopped the car and everybody except Piper got out and headed over. Hello, I'm Mayor Williams, the older man said though his expression wasn't exactly warm. Old Bobby said you had your hair on fire about something and needed to talk to me. Connie pursed her lips. Wouldn't exactly put it that way, but everybody in this town is in danger, she said. Well, before you get into that, he said, holding up a hand, why don't you tell me who you are and why you're standing in front of me, covered in blood? I'm Connie Deacon, she began, motioning to herself. Then to the guys. This is Max and Zayden. We live. Lived up in Spring Hill. The mayor's brow furrowed. Lived? he asked. It just got overrun by those things, she explained. Thousands of them. And they're marching right down the highway towards your little slice of heaven. Williams scoffed. Preposterous, he said. If that was happening, then the military would have warned us. Connie cocked a brow. Now that you mention it, where is the military? She asked innocently. Pulled up stakes a few hours ago and took off. He explained with a wave of his hand. Something about a new assignment. Which is fine by me. They weren't exactly popular amongst my constituents. She crossed her arms. They turned tail and ran. And you didn't think that was weird, she prompted. He sighed. Miss Madison here said it was nothing to worry about, he said, sounding impatient. Connie shifted her gaze to the woman with the clipboard. And Miss Madison is... The woman cleared her throat. 
I'm a liaison between the military and the state, she explained, helping to make sure that the transfer back to local control goes as smoothly as possible. Well, la di fucking da, Madison, Connie said, sarcasm evident in her tone as she flapped her hands in the air. We could have used you an hour ago, just up the road. Maybe if you had been there, I wouldn't be standing here covered in my sister's blood. Both Madison and the mayor looked visibly taken aback by the statement. Um, I'm so sorry for your loss, Miss Deacon, Madison said. Connie's fine, she said, waving her off. The military killed your sister? Williams asked, voice clearly skeptical. And a bunch of others, too, Connie replied. He looked past her into the car, spotting Piper. So what? Is she your hostage or something? he asked. Connie shook her head. Saved her life, actually, she said, then sighed. But she's not the problem. The thousand-strong mob of zombies heading our way is... That's impossible, the mayor snapped. The military would... The military isn't going to do a damn thing, Connie cut in raising her voice. Most of them have already fled the area, and most of the ones that are left have no problem shooting civilians. We're on our own. She turned to Madison. You, liaison lady, start liaisoning. I know the military had plans to pull back from town in this area, including this one and Spring Hill, Madison explained. While I pushed for defensive aid for towns such as this, thus far it has fallen on deaf ears. But wouldn't they at least warn us that something is coming our way? Williams demanded. In a perfect world, yes, they would, she replied, calm in the face of his petulance. But as I'm sure Connie will attest, this isn't a perfect world. While I don't have the first-hand experience, I have heard stories from some soldiers about their comrades taking out their anger and frustrations on civilians. She paused. In this case... It looks like they skipped town without warning anyone of impending problems. She turned towards Williams. Didn't you say you were happy that the soldiers had left? She asked. I did, he said, jutting out his chin. And why's that? Madison asked. He took a deep breath. We may have bumped heads with them a time or two, he admitted, especially when they demanded all of our gas and a significant portion of our food. Sounds like it's plausible then, Madison said. So what are we supposed to do? He demanded, throwing up his hands. There's 387 people in this town, and your car is most likely the only one running. Well, yours and Miss Madison's. Then I suggest people who can walk start doing so, Connie said. The mayor gaped at her. And go where, he asked. There's a winery pretty much due east of here outside Somerset, Max suggested. It's walkable. Somerset? Williams asked, furrowing his brow. That town had 50 people in it at most. That's why it's perfect, Max replied. Not much of a chance of those things being there, and it's far off the highway, so out of harm's way. The mayor shook his head. Half the people who are left can barely walk from their house to town hall, he said. No way they can make it that far. Then we'd better start carpooling, Connie said. Going to be murder on the fuel, Max pointed out. We know the military was taking fuel from towns this size, Connie mused, then turned to Madison. Would they waste time on a place as small as Somerset? Can't say for sure, but if it's as small and out of the way as you say it is, then I would doubt it, Madison confirmed. Zayden shook his head. It's still going to take hours to get everybody out, he said. I don't think we have that long. Then I suggest we start setting up defenses and do what we can to slow them down once they get here, Connie said. The mayor took a deep breath, but finally seemed out of arguments as he began pacing a bit. Hands clasped behind his back. Okay. What do we need, he asked. Sir, I'd suggest getting a couple of strong, reliable people and having them handle the cars, Madison said. Make sure they're locals who know the people they're transporting. Things will go easier that way. Williams nodded and pulled out a walkie-talkie. 
Bobby you copy? He asked. I'm here, Mayor. The guard came back. Get your brother and get on down here, the mayor interrupted. Got something important for you to do. Yes, sir. Be there in a few minutes, Bobby replied. Williams lowered the radio and turned to Madison. That's taken care of, he said. What else? Guns would be helpful, Max piped up. Sun's going to be down before we can get everybody out, Madison countered, shaking her head. Having people shooting into the dark isn't going to help much. We need something more. Robust. What you thinking? Connie asked. Madison pointed across the street towards a restaurant with a bar. Molotovs won't kill them, but it'll slow them down, she suggested. I like it, Connie said, pointing at her. Need some cars, too. They're out of gas, William said. She patted Zayden on his strong shoulder. Good thing we have some strapping young men who can push, she said. He and Max sighed in unison, shaking their heads. Don't worry, boys. I got a couple other guys I can call, the mayor added. Sounds like we have a plan, Madison said. Let's get to it. Everybody broke off to do their tasks. Their determination was fueled by them, knowing that time wasn't on their side with the mob of rotting flesh coming their way. Chapter 6 The sun had set on the town of Paola, but a few of the locals had battery-powered lights that they'd set up on the north side of town on the highway so that the handful of workers could continue pushing cars into the road. There were about 20 cars that they'd managed to get onto the highway, stretching out a good 20 feet on either side of the road, reaching the buildings on either side, giving them a bit more reach. There was a secondary barricade about 20 yards up the highway, just three cars lined up end to end, stretching across the road. It wasn't much, but it would slow them down a bit and hopefully break them up into manageable chunks. Connie stood in the middle of the road looking out towards the highway, the moon providing just enough light that she could make out the front edge of the mob in the distance. She listened carefully, barely making out the faintest moans. She walked over to the restaurant to her right, where Mayor Williams stood with Madison, Zayden, and Max. She unslung the shotgun from her shoulder, inspecting it to make sure it was loaded with ammo. As she entered the restaurant, she spotted the four of them standing around talking, with Madison off to the side working on Molotov cocktails. Connie sighed as she looked on, wishing that Piper was well enough. She would have been an asset to them right now, if she wasn't still so drugged up. Still, Connie knew it was the right move to have Bobby take her to safety. How are we looking out there? Williams asked as he noticed her standing in the doorway. I think it's as good as it's going to get, she replied. He furrowed his brow. You don't sound optimistic, the mayor said dryly. She shook her head. Those things ripped through the barricade in my town like it was nothing so this is only going to slow them down, and probably not for very long, she explained. Madison pulled out a wooden crate filled with Molotovs, setting it down on the table. This should help us out a bit, she said. Did you set up the secondary barricade up the road? Connie nodded. It's there, she said. That's a good idea. Where did you come up with that one? The other woman shrugged and smirked, but didn't say anything. Connie wasn't sure what Madison was hiding, but she didn't have the luxury of digging deeper at the moment, given the threat that was bearing down on them. I found us a way out too, Max said. Got a jacked up pickup truck around the corner. How much gas? Madison asked. He shrugged. Couple thimbles full at least, he said dryly. Honestly, if it gets us a mile out of town, I'll be pleasantly surprised. But if we're holding the line and need a quick escape, we got something at least. Before the conversation continued, the radio on the table kicked on. Mayor, you copy? Bobby's voice came through. Williams picked it up and raised it to his lips. How we looking? he asked. Not too good, the guard replied. Miss Madison's car ran out of gas on this trip, so my brother's staying behind to get people situated. I got enough gas for one more run. The mayor's brow furrowed. 
Is that going to be enough to get everybody out? He asked. Bobby hesitated. I don't think so, Mayor, he said. There's still about 20 people or so that need a lift. Damn it, Williams cursed. Okay, good work, Bobby. Get as many as you can in there and we'll figure something out. Copy that, the guard replied. The line went dead and the mayor shook his head in frustration, letting out a deep sigh. If anybody has ideas, I'm open to them, he said, rubbing his forehead. What's the most secure building in town? Max asked, crossing his arms. Williams shrugged. Got a bank with a vault, he replied. Okay, Max said slowly, shaking his head. What's the most secure building in town that doesn't require suffocating people inside a vault? Town Hall's probably it, the mayor replied, waving a hand vaguely around his head. Max shook his head again. That's no good, he said. Too close to the highway. What are you thinking? Cunny asked, cocking her head. We got people who can't escape, so we need to store them someplace safe so they can hopefully ride this thing out, Max explained. Madison cleared her throat. There are some two-story houses on the outskirts of town, she suggested. Let's get them there and upstairs. Lock the place up tight and keep a few able-bodied people there to defend the stairs. The group all shared looks, contemplating for a few moments. Nobody seemed to want to outright agree, but it was the only option they had. It's going to have to do, Williams finally said. Come on. We'll get a couple of the guys outside to do that now that the barricade is nearly finished. Max, can you grab that other crate of Molotovs? Madison asked, pointing. He nodded and walked over, grabbing the second large crate of sloshing bottles. All told, they had two dozen of the bottles clinking together as they exited the restaurant. They walked up to the main barricade as the zombie mob in the distance shambled into the light more. It was the mayor's first look at it and his eyes widened to saucers as the moans grew louder and louder. Sweet mother of God, he breathed. No time to gawk. We got work to do, Connie said firmly. Williams didn't move, face pale and petrified, trying hard to compose himself. Connie and Madison shared a glance, easily able to reach the other's expression. They both nodded at the same time, coming to the same conclusion. The mayor was clearly going to make their lives more difficult rather than easier. Mayor, why don't you lead those men to the people who still need help? Madison suggested gently. We can handle it from here. No, no, I can help, he insisted. Voice a little high-pitched, still unable to tear his eyes away from the mob. It's my town. Which is why you need to be with your people, Connie added to reassure them. He still looked terrified, swallowing hard, but he nodded slowly, though he still stared at the horde. Connie reached over and snapped her fingers in front of his face, making him wince and shake his head, but finally turn away. We got it, she said firmly. Get your men and get out of here. He took in a deep, shaky breath and nodded again, finally tearing himself away and walking over towards the four men who'd been pushing cars, pulling them together to deliver the message of where they were going. The rest of the group huddled up to devise a plan. Okay, how are we doing this? Zayden asked, cracking his knuckles. Madison, how's your throwing arm? Connie asked, cocking her head. The other woman smirked. Played right field for the softball team in college, she replied. Connie cocked a brow. Walk on or scholarship, she asked. Scholarship, Madison replied, and Connie blinked at her, impressed. Okay, we'll take point with the Molotovs at the outer barricade, she declared. Zayden nodded. And what do you want us to do, he asked. She pointed to the car on the fringes of the main barricade. When they start pushing through this, I want you to get this car up to speed and shove it towards them to plug up the hole, she explained. Hopefully it'll have enough speed to shove the line back a bit. Max barked a laugh. Always leaving the heavy lifting to us, huh? 
Just letting you do what you do best, Connie said, offering him a friendly smile. He smirked and shook his head, and the women grabbed their crates, walking towards the forward barricade, 20 yards away. The mob of ghouls continued to march towards them, a few hundred yards away and closing. You armed? Connie asked as they walked. Madison nodded. Handgun in a back holster, she said. You know how to use it? Connie asked. The other woman nodded again. Target practice three times a week, she replied. Okay, Connie said, feeling a bit more comfortable with her. You ever fought these things before? Had a few run-ins with them when all this started, Madison replied. I came out the other side in one piece. Connie let out a deep breath through her teeth. Good, because there are most likely a few runners mixed into this bunch, she said. If they break away from the pack, you let me handle it, okay? You only fire if I have to reload. Thankfully, the other woman didn't argue. Okay, Madison agreed. I will follow your lead. Connie was almost suspicious of how her companion was being so agreeable, but she didn't have time to figure it out, even though she was sure Madison was hiding something. She couldn't put her finger on it, and this wasn't the time to start an argument. At this moment, the only things that mattered was that she could chuck Molotov cocktails into the night and aim her handgun without putting one into her back. The duo reached the barricade and set down their crates, breathing a bit heavily from the walk. They stared out over the mob, getting ever closer. How soon do you want to start throwing these things? Madison asked. Connie took a deep breath. Let them get another 50 yards or so, and we'll head out there, she said. I'm going to cover you while you throw. She pulled out her shotgun, giving it another once over to make sure it was stocked to the fullest. You any good with that? Madison asked, inclining her head towards the gun. Better than most, the other woman replied. Madison's gaze went hard. That wasn't my question, she said firmly. I'm putting my life into your hands and I want to know if you're any good with it. Connie smirked. State champion skeet shooter placed at nationals a couple of times, too, she said. Been a couple years since then, but I still shoot every weekend. There's enough light from the moon for me to see the runners' heads. I got you covered. Madison nodded and bent down, picking up four Molotovs and motioning towards the mob. They walked out from behind the barricade, becoming visible, moving targets to the zombies. This excited them, and the moans intensified, as the corpses got line of sight on a fresh meal. It only took a moment for a couple of runners to burst from the pack, sprinting hard towards them. Connie motioned for Madison to stop as she took up a firing position, aiming downrange towards the closest creature, which was a few steps ahead of the other one. Connie waited until they were within 20 yards of her before firing, not wanting to risk wasting a precious shell. She finally fired, ripping right through the face of the lead creature before turning her attention to the other one, repeating the quick process and dropping it. They continued walking forward, getting within 30 yards of the front edge of the mob. Madison lit up the first Molotov and threw it. The flaming bottle landed just shy of the mob, splashing fire up onto the leading ghouls. It didn't take much for them to light up. Another runner broke out shoving a few creatures down as it made it out into the open. Connie quickly took aim and put it down as Madison lobbed another bottle towards them. Before she could pick up another one, there was a lot of movement within the pack, with several of the ones in the lead being shoved forward. What is that? Madison breathed, grabbing a Molotov and lighting it. Nothing good, Connie replied, and as if on cue, a pack of runners broke free from the mob. There were a half dozen of them, frenzied and attracted to the gunshot noise. Oh shit. She opened fire, quickly aiming and shooting as the pack of runners hit 15 yards of them. She managed to take out a couple of them as Madison threw the Molotov. Instead of tossing it at the mob, she made the mistake of throwing it towards the runners. The bottle hit the lead creature square in the chest, shattering and engulfing it in flame but doing nothing to hinder its movement. Connie fired off several shells in near panic, 
wanting to make sure she hit the one on fire. The first two shells hit the chest, which knocked it to the ground, but it scrambled to get back on its feet. She aimed carefully and pulled the trigger, but she was out. Madison drew her handgun and delivered the kill shot while firing at the other two nearby. As she dropped them, the two women turned and ran back towards the barricade as more runners emerged from the pack. Connie glanced over her shoulder at a dozen runners coming their way. Frantically trying to come up with a game plan, but her mind was completely blank. Get in the car, Madison suddenly barked. We'll be trapped, Connie argued. Just do it, Madison urged. And Connie didn't have any better ideas, so she ran to the other side of the three cars on the highway. Madison jumped and slid over the hood of the other one, landing and turning quickly to open fire on the runners coming their way. She managed to hit a couple in the head as Connie got into the car. Come on, Connie yelled. The other woman quickly followed, diving into the back seat and slamming the door behind her as the ghouls slammed into the car, shaking it violently. Connie clambered into the front seat as the two of them got situated and reached into her pockets, pulling out a few more shotgun shells and loading them up. Madison, meanwhile, looked out towards the mob that was slowly coming their way about 50 yards away, and closing quickly. We can't stay here, Connie warned, still looking at her task. I don't think we have a choice, Madison muttered. A few more runners shoved their way out of the mob and came up to where their comrades were, smacking against the car and shaking it harder. There were eight of them in total, surrounding the vehicle. So, only a couple of runners, huh? Madison asked dryly. Connie shook her head. Swallowing hard, they must have taken out more people from my town than I thought, she said quietly. The two of them sank down in the seats, getting as low as possible. They needed to get comfortable, because they weren't going anywhere anytime soon. Chapter 7 Zayden and Max hid behind the car that they had been preparing to push into the mob, not wanting to be spotted by the runners who were going after the car that the two women took shelter in. The duo stared dumbstruck, for a long time not saying anything. What the hell are we going to do, man? Zayden finally asked, voice quivering. Give me a minute, Max said, sounding eerily calm. The shorter man whirled on him, eyes wide. They ain't got a minute, man, he hissed. Give me a minute, Max repeated sternly. Zayden grunted in frustration leaning against the car and looking at the mob nearly there to surround them. We can't fight that man, he said, clenching and unclenching his fists. I'm aware, Max said flatly, and ran over ideas in his head. None of them were particularly good. Finally, he started shaking his head, letting out a deep, defeated sigh. Get to the house with the others. Zayden's eyes widened in shock. You want to leave them? He gasped. I'm not leaving them. You are, Max said. What? The shorter man hissed. I got a plan, but I don't need you for it, Max explained. Zayden gritted his teeth. Max, he warned. We don't have time, his friend insisted. Get to the house now. Let them know what's going on and sit tight until the sun comes up. Zayden's shoulders slumped. Max took a deep breath. Try and pull a rabbit out of a hat, he said. His friend nodded shakily and gave him a smack on the shoulder before running out from behind cover, staying low and out of sight, moving as quietly as he could. Max sat there for another moment to give him time to retreat, taking the time to survey the situation once more. You better know what you're doing, buddy, he thought to himself, then popped up from cover, moving back into town towards their escape vehicle. He got to the lifted truck reaching in and pulling himself up. He sat there for a moment, taking a deep breath before turning the key. You'd better start, you big bastard, he warned, and the truck wheezed in response before finally coming to life. Max didn't hesitate, immediately throwing it into drive and peeling out from behind the building, getting to the open field just on the outskirts of town. He made a hard turn back towards the highway, honking his horn and hitting every light he could on the truck. It was impossible for the creatures to miss him, 
with several of the runners breaking away from the barricade and rushing towards him. The truck was high enough off of the ground that the front bumper was at chest level of the creatures. He was going fast enough that the impact caved in their chests and sent the corpses flying backwards onto the pavement, smacking hard on the ground. He didn't stop to investigate to see if it was a killing blow. Rather, he continued out into the field on the opposite side of town, still laying on the horn. He made it a hundred yards away before stopping, checking his mirrors to make sure there were no runners coming towards him. He was relieved to see that several of them were crushed by the vehicle, and only a couple of others were in pursuit of him, running directly behind the truck. Max quickly threw the truck into reverse, slamming on the gas and rocketing backwards. The truck bounced up and down as the giant wheels crushed them. He put it back into drive, slowly moving away from the highway, making as much noise as he could. He was thrilled to see zombies by the hundreds were coming off of the highway and following him into the open area outside of town. That's it. Follow the leader, he declared, and continued driving, going slowly to make sure the ghouls kept up with him, but still a hundred yards away. This went on for nearly a mile, the town well in his rear view, but the zombies were still hot on his trail, still only a hundred yards behind him. The land was so flat and the moonlight bright with no place for Max to take cover from the oncoming mob. He looked around, hoping there would be some place he could jump out and take shelter as the mob passed. But there was nothing. Damn it, he muttered and looked around the cab of the truck for anything that might help him. He looked in the back, spotting a large plastic tarp. It seemed to be the only chance he had as the truck began to sputter as the gas got to the last few drops. He floored it, putting a few hundred yards between him and the mob before the vehicle ran out of gas. He immediately switched off the lights, blanketing him in darkness, before he reached through the back window to pull the tarp into the cab. He spent the next few moments spreading the tarp out as best he could, shoving it against the windows to conceal the fact that he was inside. Well, here goes nothing, he muttered and lay down in the cab, stretching out across the seats and getting as low and comfortable as he could. Several tense moments passed as he waited for the zombies to reach the truck, with the putrid scent and moans hitting him before anything else. Soon, he could hear footsteps as well as flesh smacking against the side of the vehicle. Please keep on moving, he thought, and it became a chant in his head. Please keep on moving. Chapter 8 As the sun peeked over the horizon, a few crippled zombies that had taken the brunt of the truck bumper crawled around on the ground. Connie walked over to one of them, using the butt of her shotgun to cave its head in. Madison and Zayden picked around the corpses, doing the same thing, finishing off any potential threats. Connie gave them a thumbs up and received two in return. She went back to staring out towards the field where Max had driven, luring the mob away. Even though the sun was starting to get bright, she couldn't see any sign of him or the zombies. We finished off the stragglers and got a hold of the mayor, Zayden said as he and Madison walked over to her. He said they didn't see any of those things through the night. Max did good, Madison added. Saved the town and saved us. Connie took a deep breath. Yeah, I know, she said quietly, and took a step forward. Madison put her hand on the other woman's shoulder to stop her. It's too soon to go looking for him, she said. If he didn't put enough distance between him and the town, those things might still come back our way. We gotta get the people out first. Connie shook off the hand, glaring at her. I'm going to go find him, she said. And I'll help you, Madison replied, just as soon as the people are safe. I don't know him as well as you do, but I get the sense he'd be upset if you ruined his sacrifice by bringing those things back to us. Connie gritted her teeth. That's what he'd say, she agreed. But he'd be thinking the exact opposite, cursing the fact we haven't rescued him yet. Zayden chuckled, dissolving the tension a little bit, and Connie stayed, cracking a smile. The mayor appeared near the restaurant, whistling to catch their attention and waving them over. Okay, let's go figure out what we're doing now, Connie said, 
and the trio headed towards the restaurant. When they arrived, they found the mayor in the back room, pulling down a large bottle of water and downing it. Did you get through the night okay? Madison asked. Williams gasped as he finished swallowing. It was tense there for a while, but thanks to Max, the worst thing I had to deal with was a dozen elderly people snoring in unison, he said. I think I would have rather faced the zombies, Zayden quipped, bringing a bit more levity to the room. Finally, the mayor took a deep breath. So, is the threat over, he asked. This one is, Connie said. He froze, turning to face her with wide eyes. What do you mean this one, he asked. We're a stone's throw away from Kansas City, right on the highway, she explained with a wave of her hand. It's only a matter of time before another mob of those things starts working its way down the road. When, he demanded. She threw up her hands. Do I look like a psychic to you? She huffed. Kind of, Zayden asked with a shrug. She shot him a playful glare. Shut up, you're not helping, she said, but there was no venom in her tone. Connie's right, Madison said carefully. This town isn't safe long term. The military kicked up a hornet's nest in Kansas City, and every town within 50 miles is going to be feeling the results of it for a long time to come. William sighed. Okay, but even if we had a place to go, how would we get there? He asked, rubbing his forehead. The military took all the fuel when they picked up and left. Took everything we had just to relocate everyone a few miles to the east. You said you worked for the state, didn't you, Madsen? Zayden asked suddenly. She eyed him warily. Um, yeah, I do, she said slowly. Surely your people have to know of how to get your hands on some fuel, he said, motioning to her. She contemplated for several moments. Farms, she finally said. Farms, Williams asked, sounding more than a little exasperated. Yeah, I second that, Zayden added, raising a hand. Farms? A lot of the big farms have their own fuel pumps installed, Madison explained. Connie shook her head. Wouldn't the military have drained them straight away? She asked. Madison tilted her head back and forth. Depends, she said. The biggest ones are most likely drained because they would have been a honeypot. Smaller, out-of-the-way farms. It's possible that they were left untouched. Connie crossed her arms. How do you figure that, she asked. Out of the way. For one, the other woman replied with a shrug. But the biggest thing is that the large factory farms are mostly corporate-owned, so the people who were left there didn't care one iota about the property. Smaller family farms, on the other hand. Would have had people left behind to defend it, Connie finished, nodding as she caught on. Okay, I'm tracking now. How do we find the farms, though? Zayden asked. Should have a listing in town hall on the computer, William suggested. Business and tax records. Not perfect, but should get the job done. Zayden clapped his hands. Sounds good to me, he said. We got a plan. Well, half of one at any rate, the mayor said with a sigh. Even if we get the gas, where are we going? Connie pursed her lips. Do we know where the military is pulling out to? She asked. Madison, you heard anything, Zayden prompted. She hesitated again, twisting that surety in Connie's gut that she was hiding something important. Somewhere to the north is all I know, she finally said. Connie shrugged. So that means that wherever we're going, it better not be to the north, she said. Zayden sighed. Doesn't really narrow it down, he said. Definitely want to steer clear of any major city, William said. Maybe towards Oklahoma, Zayden suggested. Just get as far away from them as we can. Connie shook her head. Kansas is my home, and I'm not going to be run out of it, she declared. Besides, if the military is running away, there's no reason for us to flee south. We just need some place we can build up and call our own. Great Bend, Madison suddenly said. The room went silent, everyone sharing confused looks, 
Then turning to her, Great Bend? Zayden asked. Where the hell is that? Other side of Wichita, Connie answered, surprising him. That's a hell of a jaunt that came out of nowhere. You got family there or something? Madison shook her head. No, but I know for a fact that it's the perfect place for us, she said. Connie had had enough. She grabbed a chair, spinning it around and sitting backwards on it. She rested her arms on the back, staring straight at Madison with a glare that said she wasn't leaving without answers. We're going to need more than that, Madison, she said firmly, if that even is your real name. Connie? Williams asked, blinking at her in shock. Something's off about you, Connie continued, ignoring him. I just can't put my finger on it. You always seem to have an answer, and you're way better with your gun than a state-level pencil pusher should be. I want to know who you are, and I want to know now. Don't know what to tell you, Madison replied with an easy shrug. I've worked at the state for five years. Worked my way up and spent a small fortune at the range. And Great Bend, Connie demanded, still not convinced couple hundred miles away when there are dozens of places just as good within an hour's drive of here. What makes that place so special? And more importantly, why do you want us to go there so badly? The other woman sighed as she were bored. It was just a suggestion, she said. And I want to know why you suggested it, Connie shot back. Madison stood there for a moment, looking around at the room. The others stared back at her with just as curious expressions as Connie's. Interests peaked now. Finally, she sighed. I suggested it because it was a forward operating base for the military, she explained. They built it up, at least to an extent. They aren't permanent fortifications, but the bones are there to build something permanent. And with them, moving north, it's going to be abandoned with no reason for them to take the fortifications with them. What about Wichita? Williams asked, spreading his hands. Aren't we going to run into the same problem we have here? Madison shook her head. The military blocked off the major highways leading out of town, she explained. So if those things start coming out, it's going to be like any other place. We'll have to keep an eye on them, but that's going to be true anywhere. That's still one hell of a haul, Zayden said slowly, drawing out his words but having some sense of security would be a plus. I think it's worth looking into, the mayor said. We have a little bit of time while we find some fuel. But if the military thought it was a good place to set up shop, might be good for us too. Connie, what do you think? Zayden asked, turning to her. She was still sitting in her chair, staring at Madison and trying to get a read on her. The woman still didn't break her confident demeanor. Connie got up, walked over to her, and stared eye to eye. I know you're hiding something, she said, voice low. I just don't know what it is. I'm not hiding anything, Madison replied, cool as a cucumber. Connie stared her down. I'm going to have my eye on you, she warned. You may think I'm some country bumpkin that can be easily fooled, but I assure you I'm nothing of the sort. If you're on the up and up, we won't have a problem. We won't have a problem then, Madison replied, staring her down right back. This seems tense, Max piped up from the doorway. What did I miss? Everyone whirled to stare at him in shock, letting out noises of pleasant surprise, and Connie tore over to him, throwing her arms around his shoulders. He laughed, hugging her back. I'm okay, he said. She stepped back and smacked him across the face, the slap echoing in the small space and surprising everyone. She shoved a firm finger in his face. You ever pull something that's stupid again and I'll... I'll... You're welcome, Connie, he said with a goofy smile, and she couldn't help but laugh as she hugged him again. When she finally stepped away, the others had clustered around them. What the hell happened, man? Zayden asked clapping him on the back. Max ran a hand through his hair. Got them going outside of town when I ran out of gas, he explained. I put a tarp up over the windows and hunkered down. Had to keep myself awake so I wouldn't snore and let them know I was inside. 
The bags under his eyes backed up his story. So they just walked past you? Zayden asked. Max nodded. They did indeed, he replied. Took forever, though. It was like an undead conga line that would never end. Zayden laughed and clapped him on the back again. Glad you made it back okay, brother, he said. And thanks for having the good sense not to include me in your little outing. Max scoffed playfully. Oh, please, I didn't do it for your benefit, he drawled. I didn't want to spend all night trapped in a truck cab with you. I've been around you when you've taken your shoes off. That's a fate worse than death. There were good-natured chuckles all around, and the group spread out a bit so they could reconvene and get back on topic. Miss Madison, if you wouldn't mind giving me a hand in the office, William said. We'll pull those tax records and figure out where we can find some gas. She nodded. Of course, she said, but lingered as the mayor exited the building. I am on your side, she said seriously to the trio. If I wasn't, I wouldn't be sticking around here. I would be off charting my own path. But I've hitched my fate to yours. So believe me when I say I'm not going to lead you astray. Her and Connie nodded at each other. Then Madison left. Max shook his head once the three of them were alone. So somebody want to catch me up on what that was all about, he asked. Later, Connie said, waving him off. Right now we need to get you someplace where you can get a nap in. Cool. I'll go see if they need any help doing their taxes, Zayden said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder and disappearing out the door. Max looked at Connie, expression soft. So my gambit worked, he asked. She nodded, swallowing hard. It did, she said. Madison and I got out safely, and none of those things got to town. You did good. She clenched her jaw. Now never do that again. He laughed. What if you're in trouble like that again? He teased. She tried and failed to hold back a smile. Okay, only in that situation, she said. Nothing like self-preservation, huh? He joked. Nothing like it, she agreed, then sobered a little. Seriously, though, thank you. You thought on your feet and didn't hesitate. Don't take this the wrong way, but where the hell has that been your whole life? He chuckled nervously, blushing a little as he rubbed the back of his neck. Kind of hard not to take that the wrong way, he said. It's true, though, isn't it? She said. We spent how many years going around to the shooting competitions together? Six. Seven. I've never seen you do anything close to that. He shrugged. Never seen you in danger like that before, he admitted. She smiled and gently took his arm into hers as they headed outside, hopefully to find him a bed to rest in. Chapter 9 The next morning, Connie sat at one of the tables at the restaurant, sipping a piping hot cup of coffee, just enjoying the quietness of the morning. The sun illuminated the small town streets, the quiet giving her time to reflect on what had happened the day before. I'm sorry, Maya, she thought, swallowing hard. I failed you. I did everything I could do to keep you safe, but I just, just... Her throat thickened, but she pulled her emotions back in check at the sight of Madison walking towards the restaurant. She sipped her coffee to try to hide the sadness all over her face. But the other woman was observant. You doing okay in here? Madison asked gently. Yeah, just finishing up my coffee, she said hoarsely and got up to leave. Madison put her hand up and reached over to grab her empty mug. Please stay, I'll get you a refill, she said with a smile. Connie reluctantly sat back down unsure of what angle this woman was playing at. But curiosity won out, and she sat down, waiting for Madison to return with two steaming mugs and set them on the table. You know, I don't envy your position at all, Madison said as she settled down across from her with her own cup. Connie blinked at her in confusion. And what position would that be? She asked dryly. You don't see it, Madison asked as she blew gently on her coffee. How can you not? She picked up two sugar packets and ripped them open, 
dumping the contents into her cup and stirring it with a spoon. Connie watched her do it, then shook her head. It's early, she said. Why don't you just enlighten me? You're the leader of this group, Madison said simply, pointing at her with the spoon. And I don't just mean Max and Zayden. Connie barked a laugh, shaking her head. You can't be serious, she said, eyebrows raised. The town has a mayor, for God's sake. And he's a moron who would be dead if it wasn't for you, Madison said before taking a sip. Connie's mirth trailed off when she realized the other woman was, in fact, serious. Still, the people respect him, she insisted. I mean, they elected him. Fun fact about Mayor Williams, Madison said with a mischievous sparkle in her eye when he ran for office. He was the only name on the ballot. He's a blowhard who wanted a title to make himself feel important. And that's what he got. Don't get me wrong. He still has his uses. But leading these survivors through what's to come, that's not one of them. Connie sat there for a moment in shock, letting the words wash over her. No, come on, she finally said, shaking her head. I'm not a leader. Yes, you are, Madison argued. And whatever doubts you have, you'd better kick them to the curb real quick, because there's a lot of work to be done. Connie scoffed. Well, what about you, Miss Liaison? she asked, throwing a hand up. You seem to have a handle on things. Why aren't you taking control? I have my reasons, Madison replied, still annoyingly calm. And once I get to the point where I fully trust you, I might be inclined to share those reasons. For the time being, though I'm not only willing to follow you, but I'll take your side in decisions. I've earned the trust of some of these people, so having my voice in your corner will help. Connie shook her head, staring down into her mug. But why? she asked. Why me? You just met me yesterday, and now you're ready to follow me. You showed more leadership capability in the first ten minutes of arriving here in town than he's shown in the last few days, Madison replied. Connie stared at her in shock. And you're willing to follow me based on that, she asked. Don't get me wrong, the other woman said. If you falter, I have no problem cutting bait. I just think out of everyone in this town, you're the only one who has the potential to pull off what needs to be pulled off. She downed the rest of her coffee and got up from the table. And in my experience, when you don't have a thoroughbred in the race, you go with the young one with the most potential. And that's you. She turned and walked towards the door. Madison, Connie called. She stopped and turned around. Yes, she asked, cocking her head. What do I do now? Connie asked, hating how helpless she sounded. Madison smiled. Well, you sit there and finish your coffee while I head back to town hall to inform the others of your decision to send Zayden and myself out to Potts Farm to check the fuel level, she said. And once you finish your next cup of coffee, you show up and act like you run the place. Get Max and one of the locals to head over to the winery and get those people prepped to move. Connie nodded slowly. And what about Mayor Williams, she asked. Make him feel important. Madison suggested. Tell him to take a few of the others and start gathering food. And if he objects? Connie asked. Ignore him, Madison said, waving a hand. Tell him it needs to be done and to get it done. He's weak and isn't going to put up a fight, especially if you get feisty. Connie smirked. Oh, I can do that, she said. Madison chuckled and headed out of the restaurant leaving Connie alone. She stared down into her mug again, trying to soak in the entirety of the conversation. She didn't want to be the leader of the group, but the more she thought about it, the more she knew that Madison was right. Williams was weak, and if they were going to survive, somebody was going to have to step up and take charge. It still felt strange that she'd picked her and was backing her so vehemently. Also, she was still hiding something, and Connie's curiosity burned. She shook her head, turning her focus solely to enjoying her coffee. She drained the mug. There was a lot to figure out, 
a lot of tough decisions needing to be made. But for the moment, there was only one thing that needed to be done. Get a refill. And for the moment, that was the only thing she wanted to focus on, because it was going to be the last easy thing she was going to do for a while. The end.